Amen. Well, praise the Lord. We're thankful that our faith is in Christ alone. Amen? Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. You can turn down a little bit, Jesse, for me. Thank you. Well, welcome to Connect Church. If this is your first time with us, we're glad that you're here. I know it has been hot, right? Man, it has been hot. I know I walked outside this morning. I was like, oh, my Lord. But I'm glad we don't have a hurricane uh, coming. So praise the Lord. Yeah, so that God is good. Amen. Well, before we get started, we want to take a moment to dismiss all of our Connect kids. So if you're in Connect kids in the elementary grades, you are dismissed to go and see your teachers in the back. Today, we're going to be actually uh, continuing on in our series in the book of Titus. We've been in Titus, and we've heard some great messages from uh, Brother Marcel and Elder Kyle and Brother Joel. It's been really good as we talk about, yeah, let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise for them. As we talk about living godly uh, in this world, and we want to focus today on how God calls us to live godly in the culture, living godly in the culture. That's an important thing, uh, especially where we live and with all the things we see going on now. We want to make sure that we're living uh, in the manner that God has called us to in a world that seems immensely dark among us. So if you have a copy of God's Word, we're going to be in Titus chapter 3. Titus chapter 3. We were actually supposed to end our series today, but we're going to continue on for one more week as we're going to break up this last uh, chapter uh, to a couple of different sections. But today we're only going to look at verses 1 through 7. Titus chapter 3 verses 1 through 7. If you would stand with me one last time as we read God's Word together, and then we're going to walk through Titus chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. The word of the Lord says, Remind them to submit to rulers and authorities, to obey, to be ready for every good work, to slander no one, to avoid fighting, and to be kind, always showing gentleness to all people. For we too were once foolish, disobedient, deceived, enslaved by various passions and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful, detesting one another. But when the kindness of God, our Savior, and his love for mankind appeared, he saved us not by works of righteousness that we had done, but according to his mercy, through the washing of regeneration and renewal by the Holy Spirit, he poured out his Spirit on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, so that having been justified by his grace, we may become heirs with the hope of eternal life. Amen. You may be seated. This is the word of God for the people of God. Now, you may have heard someone or you may have said this phrase about someone before along the lines of you're acting different. Or some people say you're acting kind of funny. Sometimes that's true. Sometimes people actually do change in their personalities. Maybe they set boundaries now. Maybe their life is a little bit different. And so we're not used to that sometimes when people change on us. Sometimes that change is actually for the better. The people become different people. They mature. They become different persons in how they think and how they feel about life and operate and all those things. And then sometimes it can be a negative change as well. For the follower of Christ, though, there should be such a change, such a demarcation in our lives that people actually notice we are different. How we engage with one another, how we engage with the life around us. And we need to ask ourselves the question, when was the last time someone said about you, you've changed because you're following Jesus? Someone really took note and mark of your life that Your responses are different. The way you think about things are different. The way you live is different because you are a follower of Christ. See, our faith in Jesus actually informs our living in the world around us because we belong to Jesus. So when you belong to Jesus, your life should be informed by that relationship. How you think, how you engage, how you walk around, all those things should be informed by following Jesus Christ. As the Apostle Paul writes to the church in Crete in the book of Titus, we've seen a common theme among all the messages that we've heard, that there is a lifestyle for the godly, that the godly are called to live righteously and engaging with the local church and engaging with false teachers and all the things that we have encountered, meaning God is the focal point of your life 
And because of your life in Christ, we're called to live in the world as those who belong to Jesus. Very simple. In fact, Titus chapter 2 verse 14 gives us this reality. He gave himself for us for this purpose to redeem us from all lawlessness and to cleanse for himself a people for his own possession. And what does that last part say? Eager to do what? Good works. We're saved or redeemed for a purpose that we may do good works for his glory. So Paul writes to the believers. In fact, he writes to them from prison. He writes for this purpose to strengthen them. And that's what we need today. We need strength in the Lord. As Paul tells them how they should stand firm against false teaching and those who would come to destroy their faith, he switches gears here in chapter 3 and gives them encouragement on how they can live in the culture as kingdom citizens. Now, here's our main point that you're going to hear over and over, or the focus that I want you to walk away with is this. Jesus changes your life to one that loves your enemies, does good toward your neighbor, and lives as a Christ follower in the land. If you don't get anything else, that's what you should get. You say, man, that is so simple. I know. But how often do we live like that? See, that's the reality. We should, we, uh, many of us have a good theology, like we understand these things, but to live it out is sometimes very hard. And we're going to be, we're going to see how challenging that is, even for the believers in Crete and how it applies to us. Again, Jesus changes your life to one that loves your enemies, does good towards your neighbor, and lives as a Christ follower in the land. So how do we do that? How do we see that? Well, let's walk through the passage in verses 1 and 2. First, the godly stay ready to do good. The godly stay ready to do good. Again, remind them to submit to rulers and authorities to obey and to be ready for every good work. As the Apostle Paul writes to the believers in Crete, he writes to believers living in and having to engage in a culture that was hostile to their Christian faith. You know, if we were in Middle Tennessee, if we were in some other place that was even in the South but in the Bible Belt, we would have a different experience of Christianity than we have here. We live in a culture in New Orleans that we would call post-Christian, meaning our culture that we live in in this city, although it is fueled by a lot of Christian themes, Christianity is not the main thrust and focus here. I don't know if you know that or not, but you understand, it, doing ministry here is hard. Yes, being in ministry other places is hard, but being in ministry here is extremely hard. Trying to, trying to actually lead a church and trying to reach through the gospel is immensely hard here. We live in a post-Christian culture. We can identify what Paul is saying to believers in Crete. They lived in a culture where the government system that they found themselves living in were opposed to the claims of Christianity. And what were those claims? Well, Jesus is Lord. Instead of uh, giving worship wholeheartedly to the emperor, and even in this time, historically, there wasn't a big push for emperor worship, although it was happening, that was the main thrust. Christians said, no, we only have one Lord, and that is Jesus Christ. Now think with me for a moment, because we have a global faith. Meaning, our Christian faith doesn't just stop at the shores of the Pacific Ocean and the Atlantic Ocean in America. It extends beyond that in places many of us have never gone before. In places like Uzbekistan and, and, and China and, and different places around the world, our Christian faith is global. So, understand this. There's a bigger, a bigger work at thrust in the global church where we have believers that are experiencing governmental systems that are anti their Christian faith. Our brothers and sisters in North Korea live under a socialist state that requires absolute obedience to the state. Understand what I'm saying here. I don't know if you've been watching the Olympics. Every time I see somebody from North Korea and lose, I feel bad for them. Like, well, they going, are they going to die? Are they going to destroy their families? Why? Because in a socialist state such as North Korea, you have full-fledged allegiance to the leader who is the government. When you go to places like North Korea, 
and you stand in front of statues of Kim Jong-un and all this kind of stuff, you have to bow. Now that creates a predicament for those who are followers of Christ. Because there's a clear distinction of actually being a citizen that is loving God and being a good citizen and pledging allegiance to the point of worship. So our brothers and sisters across the globe have to face these types of things. In fact, in places like North Korea, Christians are targeted by the state and persecuted. So I want you to keep in mind that we have believers who are experiencing, we're going to talk about here, that they're under immense persecution for having to abide by what the Scripture teaches. But what does Paul say to the believers in Crete? He tells them to tell Titus to remind them of this, to submit to rulers and authorities. The Scripture says here to obey. Now, wait, hold on. You want us to do what? You want us to obey the authorities that are anti our faith. Well, let's take 10 steps back and see what the text is teaching us. First, we have to recognize we are kingdom citizens first. That means the the government that we submit to transcends any man-made government system. What that means is that our God and his kingdom is bigger than anything or any man-made governmental system we have here. Meaning our first allegiance is to Christ and his kingdom alone. We're kingdom citizens first. Let me, can, I, can I say it again? We are kingdom citizens first. Say it with me. I am a kingdom citizen first. Okay, now, you may say, I'm a kingdom citizen first, but wait, pastor, I'm a democratic Christian. I'm a Republican Christian. I'm an independent Christian. See, why are we adding labels where no labels should be added? We are kingdom citizens. We belong to Christ first. In short, our citizenship in heaven informs our citizenship here on earth. We have ultimate allegiance to our triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We have no king but Jesus. Now, why would the Apostle Paul tell them to obey, to to make sure that they're living as good citizens in the land? Well, very easy. You can think about it logically with me. Christians were often looked on with suspicion in the Roman Empire because their conduct was so different And they met in private meetings to worship. Paul is not only giving a very practical sense of how you should live, but then we're going to see the theology behind it. Paul is saying, look, you're already looked at with suspicion, so don't be acting a fool to bring more things on yourself. What did they call Christians in the first century? Well, they said you were cannibals because why? They said, look, we we drink blood and we eat flesh. And like, whoa, 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 what are y'all doing? Again, the culture didn't understand that. The culture didn't also understand the value and dignity that Christians put upon humanity and children and women and all these things. This was foreign. So Paul says, look, you looked on with suspicion, so live rightly. It was important that they be good citizens without compromising the faith. That is the caveat, to be a good citizen without compromising the faith. Their pagan neighbors might disobey the law, but Christians must, must submit to the authority of the state, according to Romans 13. Why? Because we're representing something that transcends all this. It's exactly what Paul tells wives. Look, if you have an unbelieving spouse, live in a manner that you are living to glorify Christ so that they may see you actually believe what you say you believe. If you're cussing your husband out but saying, I love Jesus, that's a bad witness. If you're saying, I love Jesus, but then you don't pay your taxes, that is not a good witness. Now, I don't like paying taxes. It's theft. But I mean, anyway, but but here's the thing, we got to do that. I don't like obeying the travel laws. You have to obey, guess what, the speed limit is 35, that's the speed limit. As Christians, we're not above the law because we're following the God who is over all things. Yet, the same God we serve is sovereign over all the earth. He is the God who is sovereign over all nations, kings, and orchestrates the rise and fall of kingdoms for his glory. The moment it is time for America to go off the complete world scene, that is to the glory of God. 
You say, whoa, 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 hold on. I thought America was the end all be all of everything. Isn't America in the scripture? No, it's not. God is a sovereign king and ruler of all things. And how he wants kingdoms to rise, they will rise. When he wants them to fall, they will fall. Whatever happens in this earth, God is sovereign over all things. He is the God who is sovereign over nations. And Christians then have a precarious situation that we face because we live in the world, but we are not of this world, but we're called to live in a certain manner among those in the world. You say, well, where does the Scripture tell us this? Well, not only do we find it in Romans, but Jesus tells it to his disciples as well. In John 17, 13 through 15, I have given them your word. The world hated them because they are not, what, of the world. Okay, so if you're asking as a Christian, where are you from? You're not of the world, the world system, the system that you've been pulled out of. You're no longer of the world, just as I am not of the world. So what does Jesus pray in verse 15? I'm not praying that you take them out of the world in John 17, 13, 15, but that you protect them from the evil one. So Jesus prays for his disciples that, guess what? I'm leaving you here to engage in the world. I'm just praying the Lord keeps you protected from the evil one. We have to believe what the Bible teaches, that God is sovereign and rules over all authorities, and God can bring about good even in any situation, in every situation that is surrendered to him. So Paul here uses the term rulers and authorities. In short, he's talking about secular government. As kingdom citizens, we are to submit willingly to the governing authorities that have been put in place as governments have a role to play in the world as they have been ordained by God. Now, this does not mean Christians are supposed to, supposed to simply blindly submit to unjust laws or demands of the government that go clearly against God's commands. For example, if the government, now I, I don't have any more children, but let's say I was going to have more children. If the government passed a law and said, you're only allowed to have one child, I'm breaking that law. (laughs) Why? You're not going to govern me to say, guess what? You cannot have life when life actually has value, dignity, and worth so that I can live by some agenda that does not glorify God. That's the difference. If the government passed a law and said, hey, look, you know, Christians, no longer can you worship on a Sunday. No longer can you come together and gather. Oh, we're just going to gather. Now, I have to accept the consequences. So convictionally, I have to say, you know what, if I'm going to go against this, I better make sure what I'm going against, number one, the law itself that they've passed or they've put in place does violate God's commands and law. Therefore, when I go against this, I will accept whatever consequences come with it. Whether that's losing my life, whether that's losing my job, whether that's losing whatever. Why? Because my allegiance is to Christ first. Y'all see how that works. Now, that's not saying, well, I don't like the millage that they passed, so therefore I'm to... No, like, look, this is just a part of being a part of this system. No, Christians should then, as much as possible, participate in the secular government as citizens of a kingdom higher than the earthly one. Do y'all understand what I'm saying there? So that means that as a Christian, as much as possible, we should engage with the system that we live in for God's glory alone. That means we don't shy away. We don't run away. That means we engage for God's glory. Romans 13 tells us what this looks like. Paying taxes, obeying laws, etc. Doing those things as kingdom citizens do. Think about it. If you went to a, 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 a neighborhood association meeting, are you going there as just simply a citizen that lives in this neighborhood? Or are you going as, I'm a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. I'm going into this meeting first with my allegiance to Christ. And that allegiance is going to inform what I say, what I think, what I do, and how I engage because I'm thinking of my God and loving my neighbor as myself. But how often do we engage with these things? Well, I'm upset with something that's going on, so instead of me engaging as a Christian, I'm just going to engage how all the world does. No, it's different for us who are kingdom citizens. 
as Christians, we are kingdom citizens first. And this citizenship dictates how we are then to live as kingdoms within the national sense. So we are to obey the laws of the land, rendering, un, rendering unto Caesar what is due to him, and the things that are God's, we render unto God. The scripture is clear that the government was put in place by God and has been given by God the authority to wield the sword and enact laws. Now why bring this up? Well, Paul says to Christians here, be ready for every good work. So we have a responsibility not to just be passive by obeying laws, that's a part of it, but we have an active role to play in society. We as Christians have an active role to play in society. Imagine if you're the only Christian on your, on your street, right? And let's say there's something wrong going on in your neighborhood, crime is going on, stuff like that, and all your other neighbors say, ah, you know what, it is what it is. You as a Christian, though, say, no, that's not right. Because murdering someone is not only causing us to live in, a, in fear of living in this neighborhood, but this does not bring glory to God. So as a Christian, I'm informed to now act and do something about it. No matter if nobody else does. I'm going to live out my Christian faith openly and publicly. What I say, what I do, is informed by what I believe. The world system wants you as a Christian to not bring your Christianity anywhere else but right here. I'm telling you, politicians, uh, government policies, interest groups, all this kind of stuff, they're fine with us praying in our little churches and being right here, but don't do anything else outside these four walls. Be a Christian in secret and name only, not in action and deed. As people say, the devil is a liar. No, we are Christians not just in coming together and gathering. No, we live out our lives expressively in the culture as well. We do not have a faith that is hidden behind four walls. No, we go out and advance the gospel in the culture. You may say, well, why are we bringing our faith to bear on everything? Because Jesus says to walk in the light and walk in truth. We desire God's kingdom to come and his will to be done. This is our desire as followers of Christ. We want to see God's will to be done. You say, well, man, I don't want to enforce anything on anybody else. We're not forcing anything on anybody else. We're standing firm in what God has said about things and what God believes about this. And we want to bring that to bear on anything we engage in. Understand this truth. Christians have a biblical obligation to never shy away, but engage the cultural context where God has placed them. I want you to get that. Really chew on that. We have, and you can put that up there for them so they can see it, we have a biblical obligation to never shy away, but engage the cultural context where God has placed us. That means if, if God would move me and my family from here to somewhere else, Guess what we're going to do? Live out our faith wherever that is. In our neighborhood, in the government, at the grocery store, at the doctor's office, on my job, wherever I find myself, I want to live as salt and light for the glory of God. Well, the question could be asked then. Paul says, look, be ready for good works. Then what are these good works? Think of what Jesus said. We're salt and light. We're called to shine this light everywhere we go and understand this is all about loving our neighbors ourselves. This good works is vast and broad. It's, it's whatever you can think of. Like what are the good works that God has called you to do in your local context? What are the needs that you see that you can meet to make sure, guess what? I'm loving God and I'm loving people. These are the good works. I think the problem that we have, especially in 21st century American Christianity is this, is that we want to hire out for everybody to do the things that we should do. Understand this. If, somebody put, if the Lord puts a burden on your heart to reach young people, you say, man, I really want to reach young people, and I want to mentor them. I want to pour into them. I would love to reach them. Then guess what? You should find a way to say, how can I do that? How can I, Lord, what, show me the resources. Show, show me what I can do, God. Open up the door. Maybe I need to partner with somebody. Whatever I need to do, I want to do this for God's glory alone. 
Well, what does it look like to be a good kingdom citizen living as a U.S. citizen? Because here's the thing. This passage is true no matter where you are in the world, but contextually it may look different. Being a good citizen in, uh, in China is going to look different than it does in America. So we're going to talk about what does it look like to live as a U.S. citizen, but be a kingdom citizen first. Now, our country is a democratic republic. Right? And we know that in our country, one of the main ways that we see people get engaged, not only just in the aspect of advancing the good works in society, is now through politics. You say, oh, Pastor, you're going to talk about politics. Don't do it. Don't do it. I'm going to have to do it because you talk about it anyway. Understand this. Politics is meant to be only a vehicle to enact change in the local, state, and national level. As citizens... Of our nation, we have been given the right to vote, express our voice. We see people expressing their voice through protests and all these different things. We have a voice in the process. However, the problem that we have now is that politics has become an identity marker for some, a religious practice for others, and simply put, something that divides and doesn't unite. Politics makes a bad thing to worship. But here's the reality. As kingdom citizens, we cannot sit back and act like these things just don't exist. Now, we can act like and put our heads under the sand and say, oh, you know what? All this stuff is going on around me. I'm just going to act like it's not there. La, 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 la. I'm going to sing my worship songs. That is the wrong way to engage in the culture. Because what that is saying is that, one, you either, A, don't really care about what's happening around you, or two, you're remiss to understand your duty to live out as a Christ follower in the culture. Again, why do I bring up this point? Because we can't escape politics. Living in the society that we live in. In fact, the word politics originates from the Latin and the Greek, both which mean a resident of a city or a citizen. That's all it means. So then we have to begin to say, well, I'm a kingdom citizen first. And my politics or life as an American, American citizen should be informed, fueled, and guided by my relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ and his kingdom. Hear what I'm saying, my brothers and sisters. That means whatever we do and however we engage as a citizen should be informed by my relationship with Jesus, not the other way around. See, many of us want how we engage with the culture to be informed by the culture. No, it has to be informed by what God says about things, what God thinks about these things. As one pastor remarked, government belongs to God, and he has something to say on every issue. He said, no, God doesn't. Yes, he does. Open God's word and ask, Lord, what do you have to say about this? Is that the lens that you're looking at? at the world through. What you think, say, or hear that disagrees with the Word of God says on any subject, you have taken the wrong side. It's very simple. If you look at an issue, no matter what it is, and God's Word says something different, guess what you have to side? With God. If you look at an issue and say, well, man, that doesn't line up with what God says, then guess what? I'm lining up with God. Now, this begins to make the Christian very much not wanted anywhere. But you know the problem is we want to be wanted everywhere. But the truth is we are wanted in one place and one place alone. That is in God's kingdom alone. So meaning, guess what? The one place you're going to fully fit all the time in God, is in God's kingdom. In the culture, we just won't. We want to be accepted so bad by everyone and everything that we, guess what we will do? We will blaspheme the name of Jesus to, in order to, for us to fit in this party and that party. Are you, have you, ask yourself the question, have you blasphemed Jesus' name? By saying, my Jesus fits with this party. We see it all the time. You just watch. Watch. Look at the agendas of of both. And then see how they try to fit God into the box. Blasphemy. In relation to voting, we're not always so much asking who, 
But how and what? Essentially, Lord, how have you called me to live first? What do you have to say about the life I'm supposed to live as a citizen of the land? And how does my role and relation as a kingdom citizen inform how I am going to vote? How am I going to live? How am I going to engage with my neighbor? Sadly, instead of asking God how we should think regarding politics, life, money, marriage, sexuality, many who say they love the Lord reject his leading in areas that we need him in. When was the last time you went to Jesus and said, Lord, what should I do? Lord, what do you see about this? What do you say about this? How should I see this? What what lens should I be looking in? My fellow Christians, my brothers and sisters in Christ, we're called to bring all issues under the lordship of Christ. That means aligning our thoughts and actions with his will in every area of our life. That even means how we vote. That even means how we engage in our neighborhoods. That means how we engage with our local, uh, local state and national, all these things. We, we bring to bear, what does God say about it? When you think about your life and how Jesus has changed you, are you steadily asking the Lord to help you do good for his glory, that your life is defined as a kingdom citizen first that informs you living as an American citizen? The thing that would do us well, that we don't want will be persecution. Now, there's no shouting and no amens on that because who wants to be persecuted? I know I don't. But persecution would be the refiner's fire that begins to remove any kind of identity thing, any kind of demarcations that you say, any dividers. Why? Because when persecution comes, it is a refiner's fire to show these are those who really are Jesus's. When persecution comes, the Democratic Party won't save you. When persecution comes, the Republicans won't be there for you. When persecution comes, whoever you put in your hope in, they will say, bye-bye, was nice knowing you, but guess what? I don't align with you. You align with that Jesus king. We are king over here. Wait, 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 I thought, I thought we was all good. No, you thought. Because you continue to put yourself and put Jesus in the box that he can't be boxed in. We live in a world system that is ruled by the evil one. And Satan's MO is lying, deception, and hate. So ask yourself the question, when you hear even an opposing view, how does it make you feel about that person? Does anger, haste, disaster thinking, bitterness, all those things, and they come up in your heart. The Bible says here, we should be ready to do good works. Why? For others. We're still right there. Look what he says, be ready for every good work. And look at verse 2, to slander no one, to avoid fighting, and to be kind always, showing gentleness to who? Some people. No, only black people. No, 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 only, only those who support and uh, Kamala, only those who are supporting Biden, only those who are supporting Trump, only those who are supporting the mass, only those who are supporting the COVID vaccine, only those who support. We are so divided. I'm talking about as Christians. That does the world even recognize we belong to Jesus? We're pulled daily to drink from a well of news media, political pundits, and candidates who are selling fruit that only leads to anger and haste and disastrous thinking and bitterness. These are not fruits of the Spirit. We as kingdom citizens have to saturate our hearts, our minds, our spirits with the Word of God and filter what you're hearing and responding to with a biblical worldview. Some of us get on MSNBC and then we get mad. Not at what they're saying, but we get mad because of the, uh, I can't believe these people. Some of us get on Fox News or Newsmax or whoever you're listening to. And you're like, man, I can't believe these people. And the things you would say in your mind, in your heart, you would never say out of your mouth in person to somebody. And the sad reality is some of us will say, I'll go to a church with people who look different than me, even vote different than me, but truly I can't stand them. 
consuming the 24-hour news cycle, and it's not just on, uh, on, on, on Hulu and whoever you watch. I'm talking about on TikTok. I'm talking about on YouTube. I'm talking consuming the 24-hour news cycle is unhealthy for your mind and spirit. Maybe the reason you're so depressed is because you keep listening to depressing things. Consuming this diet makes people downright mean and hopeless. Can I tell you something? People actually like Jesus. No, hear what I'm saying, my brother. Says, people actually liked him for his disposition and his demeanor. Do people see a disposition of Christ in you, or do you just know about Jesus? While we stand on the truth, and point people to the truth, Christians who have been changed by the finished work of Jesus actually love people. I, I'm, I'm trying to tell y'all, look, look, I, I know y'all saying amen. He, hear what the scripture's saying. Just get in the text. I'm, I'm telling you, this, this is challenging. Because the Bible says we should be ready to do good works, to slander no one, to avoid fighting, and to be kind always, showing gentleness to all people. That means it matters what you say and how you say it. That means if you're in the office and people are talking about the current president or the soon-to-be president and they're using derogatory language, you should not be participating in that. Oh, you don't understand. You don't understand, I'm in a barbershop, they're talking about this one racist, that one racist, da, da, da. They could be saying whatever, but you're representing a kingdom that's bigger than them. So what are your words saying and what are your actions saying about what you believe? But I'm going to tell you something, many Christians don't care about that. Long as we fit in, long as everybody feels good about what we're saying, and long as we look like the crowd, we're good. What does the text say? To slander no one, to avoid fighting, to be kind, always showing generous to all people. So here's the thing. The, the idea of to try Jesus, not me, because I fight is not biblical. I love Jesus, but I'll cuss you out is not biblical. The whole idea, well, you know me. I go from zero to 100. Number one, maybe you need to see a counselor. Maybe you need to get your heart checked. Maybe there, there, there are unresolved traumas that you have that you need to bring to Jesus because your temper should not be going off just because somebody cuts you off or somebody is thinking different than you. Some of us, maybe we don't need to engage quickly online or engage in talking to people in a manner. Maybe sometimes just be quiet. Everybody doesn't need to know your opinion on everything. I know everybody thinks their opinion is the highest, but sometimes your opinion don't matter. Just don't say nothing. It would do better to be quiet and to be reserved for the glory of God than to make a fool of ourselves with our words. What does he say? Not to slander anyone. Avoid fighting. Be kind and gentle. Now, before we even look at these, look, think about this. You may be saying, well, man, if I'm not this, I'm going to be a doormat. Then ask yourself, was Jesus a doormat? He wasn't. Jesus was strength embodied, but also compassionate and kind. See, just because you're kind and compassionate doesn't mean you're a pushover. Sometimes we're kind and compassionate because we do have the power that we could destroy somebody, but we choose not to. This is talking about lifestyle and attitude. An attitude of the heart. To slander is the same word as to blaspheme. It's to speak of a person in an evil and malicious way. It is to verbally abuse a fellow image bearer. Look, we get online and we hear people do this all the time. They, ab they verbally abuse an image bearer because the image bearer thinks different than them. We shouldn't do that as Christians. This is the Bible telling us we should not slander or blaspheme to speak ill or evil in a malicious way to verbally abuse someone. Think about, think about this, my brothers and sisters in Christ. When you're engaging, even in this political climate, what is your language like? When you're speaking of those who don't know Jesus, how are you speaking about them and to them? Like Jesus... We should be peaceable and gentle 
See, instead of acting out in violence for revenge or following the culture, we instead should be peacemakers. Our attitude is gentle, meaning we are willing to show grace to others and we are considerate. When we don't compromise our morals, we don't compromise the truth of the gospel, but guess what? We love people. We love people. Why? The godly are not too harsh with their neighbors. I spent too long on that, but hopefully you got the point. Here it is, verse 3. For, we're t- for we, too, were once foolish, disobedient, deceived, enslaved by various passions and pleasures, living in malice, envy, hateful, detesting one another. Here's the point Paul is making. Lest we forget what the Bible said about Cretan culture. I want you to see this whole point because it all ties together. Paul said of this of the Cretans, right? He says, look, one of their own prophets said, Cretans are always liars, evil, evil, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. That's what, he, that's what they observe, observe of the culture. That's what the culture looked like. So that's the culture they were living in. But as a Christian living godly for the Lord and seeking what is just and right, we have to be careful we don't begin to despise and demean those who we should be proclaiming the good news of the gospel to. In short, it's like this. I'm saved now. I've been saved for a little while. I know Jesus. I've been living right. I don't drink no more. I don't smoke no more. I don't hang out with people who do. And now my life is all clean. And you get around some folks that's a little dirty. And you begin to say, why are you so dirty? What do you smell? You smell. You forget how you used to smell. You remember how dirty you used to be, but you're going to talk about the person who needs to be cleaned up like you were by Jesus and you didn't clean up your own self? Understand this. Jesus changes your life to one that loves your enemies, does good towards your neighbors, and lives as a Christ follower in the land. You may say, well, why? Because verse 3, for we too were once foolish disobedient, deceived, enslaved by various passions and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful, detesting one another. Oh, not me, pastor. You just don't know. I was just saved a little bit. I wasn't as bad as Jim and them. You know, Jim and they used to run around. They'd do all that kind of stuff. I just did a little bit. Here's the thing. A little is a lot to the Lord. We all were detestable in its light, but his grace and mercy showed to us goodness. So Paul has him look back. First he says, look, remind them in this world you are kingdom citizens, so live like it. Do good among the culture for the Lord Jesus Christ. Yet don't get caught up in self-righteousness or forgetting that, guess what, you too used to be a pagan as well. I know we saw the Olympics, and we had all kind of stuff going on, and we was looking at that. What you saw is European postmodernism. That's what pagans do. But then the moment many people saw it, I can't believe it. We need to boycott the Olympics. We need to do it. What are you up in arms about? This is what the world does. They are blind and deceived by the evil one. What do you expect? We as Christians, though, see the reality, and then now we can give an answer to say this is who God is and do it in a way that glorifies him as we're engaging with people. Again, we have to recognize we too once were pagans. We can't forget and be safe for so long that we forget that people need Jesus as well. This is why we got to be careful when we're engaging with those who are caught up in other sexual sins and caught up in uh, adultery and LGBTQ, all this kind of stuff. We, cannot, we can't move ourselves from the truth, but we have to stand firm on the truth, but also move in robust compassion. Some of us need to go back and be like, you know what, I'm going to say this. I think this is reality. The reality why we don't see people breaking down the doors, I'm not talking about unsaved people, I'm talking about Christians, people who profess to be followers of Christ, breaking down the doors and being like, man, I need to be in a healthy local church, I need to be serving the Lord, is because I firmly believe many people don't realize, number one, they haven't come to the true knowledge of Jesus Christ. Then number two, if they have come to the true knowledge of Jesus Christ, they think they were so good before Jesus. There's a song when I first got saved. I, I, I'll never forget, I got saved when I was a sophomore in college. 
in the, in the 2000s. And there was a song by this, this band called Delirious, and it's very simple. It just says, thank you for saving me. What else can I say? You, you took my sin away. What else can I say? You shed your blood for me. What else can I say? And then he just goes, great is the Lord. Great is the Lord. I sing, I, I sing that often even now because I remember where I was. And let me tell you something. If I'm not pastoring tomorrow, I'll be in a church tomorrow, though. If I'm never preaching again, if this is my last Sunday ever preaching to you, you guess what? And guess what? I may not be here. I'll be in somebody's church. Worshiping Jesus, bowing my knee, serving the body of Christ. Why? Because I loved Jesus first. I don't serve in, as a pastor because of, of, oh, look, this is my way of earning my way. No, I live this life because I love the King. And he says, look, you have to remember you were once enemies of God. You once rejected his will. You once rejected his way for your life. But in relation to others, we need to see people the way Jesus sees them. Look what it says. We lived in envy and were just downright hateful. This is the word malice, a feeling of hostility, a strong dislike with a possible implication of desiring to do harm. Think about where our world is where somebody get up on a roof and shoot somebody because they think different politically than them. Think about the world we live in where folks will be wet. Look, we are in a time where folks will be like this. I'll cut ties with you over politics before Jesus. Oh, you could blaspheme Jesus' name. You could talk about uh, all this stuff. You could talk about Christianity. But, but, oh, hold on. Don't touch my God of Democrat. Don't touch my God of Republicanism. Don't touch my God of whatever. Why? Because we worship at altars that are man-made and not God-designed. Again, I should have just preached something more lighthearted, but this is good. In a culture, weighing on you to despise people and even hate people, you should be reaching with the gospel. You have to remember what God saved you from and what he's saving you to. My brothers and sisters in Christ, can I implore you, can I implore you, number one, You're going to have people around you that are going to think differently than you. And guess what? There's things you're going to say and try to show them and show them what the truth is and stuff like that. And they guess what? They're just going to reject it. But guess what? We should ask the Lord, Lord, help me to have a heart of love for them, not a heart that despises them. Come on, let me ask y'all a real quick question. Do you despise? And look, I'm just reading the room. So I'm going to go both sides because I get blamed. You just talk about the white people too much. Talk about the black people too much. Let's talk about everybody right now. If you are African-American in this room, do you despise whites because they vote more Republican? If you're white in this room, do you despise folks who are African-American and they vote more Democrat because you're on a different side? And all of a sudden you begin to say, man, the people you should love, now you hate. And instead of being a gospel witness, you are now saying, look, the only thing I'm pushing is what political agenda I have. You are now devaluing your place as a kingdom citizen. Have you shared more about Kamala and Trump than you have about Jesus Christ and him crucified? When you have the opportunity... To go and go off, do you, instead of going off, you reject it when you're on social media. Is your first inclination to go to the crowd and what everyone else is saying, what everyone else is sharing? Are you talking to Jesus? See, David is a great example of this. He was mistreated by Saul, but he showed kindness to Saul's last remaining family member, bringing Mephibosheth to the table, showing kindness. Understand this and put this point out for them so they can see it. The Christian can be kind, compassionate, and stand in truth as well. We can. We can be kind, compassionate, and stand in truth as well. Because why? There are things that I I believed at one time that I don't believe now. I'm thankful for someone who took grace with me and, and walked with me. Let's not run people away from Jesus by living as if we don't belong to him. 
Why? Because the godly remember the kindness of the Savior. Here's the thing. My last point, I'm going to close with this. Look at verse 4. But when the kindness of God our Savior and his love for mankind appeared, he saved us. Not by works of righteousness that we had done, but according to his mercy through the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. This is the entire point Paul is making here. You are part of God's kingdom, not because of how good you were, not because of the good works you're doing now, not because you were so clean. No, we were wicked, we were evil, we were enemies of God, and it was his rich mercy shown towards us, his kindness shown towards us, uh, the wayward sinner who welcomed us into his kingdom and gave us a seat at the table. This is how we are saved. You say, well, why should I show kindness and compassion to someone who's caught in sin? Why should I be patient with some another believer who's not even maturing as fast as I desire them to mature? Because of God's rich grace and mercy. Remember the main point? Jesus changes your life to one that loves your enemies, does good towards your neighbor, and lives as a Christ follower in the land. So we do good in the land towards others, not because our good works save us, No, we're made right with God because of the finished work of Christ. And this leads us to be ready to do good for his glory. The biblical fact is that people cannot earn salvation. This actually strikes at the heart of human pride. It denies people this opportunity of exalting themselves. No, we who are who we are, it is but by the grace of God. We're saved by grace through faith. We are kingdom citizens who've been regenerated. That's what the Bible says. We have been regenerated. Essentially, that means we have been born again. We have a new life. We're filled with the Spirit. And notice, it's our triune God who's in operation here. God the Father sending the Son, the Son paying for our redemption, and the Spirit filling us and making us new creations for His glory. This idea of justification is being declared right with God because of the finished work of the Son. But as one pastor said it this way, not only does does he forget our sins, but he forgets that we were even sinners. That's good news. That God shows us with his grace and mercy. So we're kingdom citizens of his kingdom, living in a present world, called to do works, good works. We're called to love our enemies, but guess what? The Bible says here we have a heavenly hope as well. Look what it says. He poured out his Spirit on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that having been justified by his grace, we may become heirs with the hope of eternal life. We are heirs of a kingdom that is bigger than our nationality or ethnicity. What does that mean? That means for each one of us, this should inform how we vote. This should inform how we live. This should inform uh, the things we say and the things we do. Why? Because the kingdom I'm a part of transcends the kingdoms of this world. So God then leads us to live in obedience to his kingdom first. That means today we can draw on his riches. And that when he comes, we'll share in the wealth of his kingdom forever. That's the hope we have. And we're holding on to the hope we have in Christ. And while we wait for this blessed hope, we stand firm in that. I'm no prophet, no son of the prophet, but I can tell you, it's going to be interesting, not only the next several months, but the next years ahead. But one thing we can be firm and firm in is that the gospel will never change. God's word will never change. Christ is still holding us. And guess what? The hope we have in him, we can rest in that he is good no matter what. So as you think about being a kingdom citizen, as you think about living in this culture, has Jesus changed your life to the point where you're loving your enemies? Ask yourself the question, am I loving my enemies? Am I praying for those who I disagree with? Am I loving them as Jesus loved me? Am I doing good towards my neighbor? Am I thinking of my neighbor when I engage in the culture around me? Am I doing good towards my neighbor? Am I even leaning into the Holy Spirit and saying, God, the Holy Spirit, show me what good works I can do for your glory to the world around me? Am I living as a Christ follower in the land and do people know it? Do people know you're a Christ follower? 
Or they only know you for the things you stand for on this and that and this and that. Or do they know you stand firm on Christ and him crucified? I want us to take a moment just to reflect on this. Maybe there's repenting that needs to happen. Maybe there's repenting in our hearts to say, Lord, we put things above you. Maybe there's been a haste that we've been in instead of pausing to ask God, Lord, how should I vote? How should I think? How should I engage with these issues? We're going to talk more about this next week. Lord, how should I live? Father, in this moment, as we pause, Lord, I want to ask for forgiveness for myself, Lord, because so often, God, we get so wrapped up in what the culture is saying, what the culture is doing, and, and the next thing to protest, and the next thing to get mad at, the next person to be mad about, that we forget that we are here for a purpose. God, forgive us, forgive me, Lord. Well, often you can hear what they're saying politically and you can hear what they're telling you to do instead of pausing and actually looking for ourselves, and then bringing what they're saying under the word of God. And if it doesn't line up, us removing ourselves from it. Oh, Lord, forgive us for singing that you're altogether lovely, but not living like it. Maybe you're in this room this morning, you need to place your faith and trust in the Savior, the one who can pull you from the bondage of sin. The one who can give you everlasting life and place you in a kingdom that is bigger than anything this world can offer. Thank you, Jesus. If you need to respond to any of these, look, you can come down front. We'd love to pray for you. Or you can meet us at the Next Step desk, wherever you find yourself. Maybe God is doing a work in your heart. And you say, man, I just need to respond. I need to surrender my whole life to Jesus. Can we stand as we respond and can we just sing that chorus all together lovely worthy thank you Jesus wonderful to me let's sing it together here I am to worship here I am to bow down. Here I am to say that you're my God. Sing it to the Lord. You're all together lovely, all together worthy, all together wonderful to me. Come on, is that your prayer to the Lord? Here you are to worship. Can we just sing it to him? Surrendering your mind and your body and your will to say, God, whatever comes my way, I want to do your will. I want to live for your glory. I want to do the good works you've called me to do, God.